Good morning, everyone here in the church building, as well as those joining us online. My name is Berna, and I have the honor of serving on our worship team. I also have the honor of reading the teaching text to you this morning. Our teaching text comes from Matthew 23, verses 5 through 12. It reads, But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. February 9, 2009 is a day that changed us all. It may have impacted your life more than anything else that has impacted your life in the last 10 years, your everyday behavior. Do you remember that? Remember that feeling of how everything changed? February 9, 2009 is when Facebook added the like button to posts. <laughs> you don't think it was much. It completely re-ent- uh, reoriented our society's psychological understanding of itself. I remember getting poked on Facebook. <laughs> I was actually thinking this morning, that's such an aggressive term, they should have used tapped. Tapped, they used poked. But when they added the like feature, all the psychology shifted where now there was a social proof and performative dynamic that entered in. Before it was nice if a couple of friends commented on your post, but now we made posts so that people would comment. It added performance to life itself, something that had never happened at this scale in all of human history. And here's the thing, that has bled into how you practice your faith. You cannot live in a performance-oriented society and then just take those clothes off and pop into church. That stuff gets in you. It touches the deep motivational structure of our hearts. It changes the reference points of where we seek validation and attention. And I want to say this, when it gets in the church, that reshuffling of human psychology does horrific damage to the practice of our faith. And that's what we see in this particular passage. We are in a series called Converting the Church, and we're saying this because so often we think we need to convert the world, but we're kind of looking around the last five years and going, maybe Jesus needs to convert the church back to Him. Maybe we're the ones that need a deep, profound reorientation. So we're looking at what Jesus says about that, not just human standards about that. There's a lot of people complaining about the church right now, but here is Jesus giving it a critique in the direction that He wants it to be. And in this one here, in this passage, Jesus warns about the the potency of performance-oriented religion. He says this in Matthew chapter 16. He told his disciples, be on your guard against the yeast of the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is interesting to me because his understanding, he talks about salt and light, the potency of faith applied properly to bring cultural change. But he also says, you have to guard yourself against a kind of cultural change coming in and shaping the way you practice your faith. And so this talk is a pretty simple talk. I have two big ideas. The first idea is that religion practiced wrongly is about self-seeking status, and that when converted properly, it is about secure servanthood. So let's look at what Jesus critiques in this particular passage. Everything they do is done for people to see. 
They make their phylacteries wide, the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. So in this little section, Jesus gives four diagnostic markers, four tells in the heart about what is happening externally when it comes to religion. The first one is this. He says, they are living a performative life. Everything they do is done for people to see. And so this basically says that, that they have taken something that is designed to connect them to God. They've taken something that is, well, the authority that they've been given to serve and shepherd and lead other people. And they're using all of that and redirecting all the attention towards themselves. Everything they do is done for people to see. And it's, it's hard, honestly, I don't, I mean, I'm just going to be honest here. It's hard just to like live your life, isn't it? without social proof that you lived your life. It's hard to just have a great moment and have a great moment. It's like, I gotta share this moment. Others need, others don't need to see, others don't need to share this moment with me. Others need to know that I'm having moments like this. (laughs) We call them Instagram worthy moments. It's because they're moments that have to be shared. Now, when you go to faith, You've got to be very, very careful not to do this. It can be confusing at times because in the Sermon on the Mount says, do not practice your righteousness in front of people. But then he also says, don't hide your light under a bushel. Like, how do you make sense of that? It's very, very challenging. Well, the key is motives. Who's getting the glory from what it is that you do? And Jesus says, there's re- legitimate religious activity here. They are doing what the law required, what it meant to be God's covenant people, but the, the, they were looking for validation all the time from a human audience. This is the first sign of toxic religion that Jesus hates in this. It's perf- a performative life, living a performative life. Second thing, carefully curated appearances. Now, the phylacteries, I mean, the, the gift of living uh, around the New York area is that you interact with the Jewish community a lot. And so, for, you know, when I was in Orlando, I was not super aware of this dynamic. But if we can show these, these are the phylacteries and then the tassels on the garments. This next slide here, these are actually, uh, they dug these up. These are tassels from the first century. It's an example of what they would have done. And it's amazing to me how often we can take these symbols and we can turn them, what are supposed to be religious markers of devotion, and turn them into self-seeking status symbols. Uh, this, uh, this painting here, this was done by Jan uh, Steicher in 1892. It's called The Rabbi. You can see how somebody who is, is, is sincerely living a devoted practice, you can see how quickly and how easily this could bleed into a kind of external righteousness. Now, we may look at them, uh, the Jewish community, and say, why are they taking this so literally? Did God literally intend that they put a box of the Scriptures on their head and wrap their arms and put cords on their coats? And we may think, that's, that's so irrelevant, but we've all got a version of this. In some traditions, it's how big is your hair? Other traditions, when I was coming up, I became a Christian in the Assemblies of God. It was all about the size, the size of your Bible. It was like that big study Bible. I had the, you ready? I had the Revival Study Bible. I've spent time, and this is basically what, it's just virtue signaling. We do it in our society. Here's an example of virtue signaling in our society. You see these sort of secular, secular creeds. We believe love is love, black lives matter, climate change is real, diversity strengthens us, justice is for all, no human is illegal. Everyone uh, deserves, what does that say? Everyone, everyone deserves, I need to move up to the 2.0 reading glasses. Everyone deserves healthcare. Now, here's the thing. People put these signs on their lawn. They put them in their windows and all the rest of it. But I'm always amazed how these signs appear in $3 million Upper West Side windows. And it's like, if you believed that, you would sell your apartment and you give the money to, to justice causes. And you would, you would certainly not fly anywhere and utilize the atrocious, atrocious environmental damage 
of flying in on plane. Like you would radically shift your lives, but it's kind of a, well, it's, it's, it's not actually a deep commitment to structural change and justice. It's kind of like, hey, we're with you and that's it. But don't ask anything of me, but I got you, but don't, I don't. It's a very awkward cultural arrangement because it's signaling without substance. And that's the great challenge. This is what they were doing. God wanted them to have a deep, deep sense of being, a deep sense of practice. They were all just signals. I remember, I spent some time trying to answer, when is the first time in, the, in my Christian life did I consciously pull this pharisaical move, which was adjust something in order for recognition? I, remember, I went back and I, I found the root of it in my heart. There's some layers in there, I had to get it. I became a Christian the weekend I turned 17, and then that was in October. And then we did a, a winter uh, retreat, which is, uh, sorry, we did a January retreat, uh, which is hard to describe because it's the absolute peak of uh, heat in Australia. And I remember going on this retreat and wanting my small group leader. I just, it was a woman, I just wanted her validation. And I remember getting my Bible and marking it up. Now, look, you can mark your Bible up. That's how I do it. I'm like, so I cannot concentrate without like hitting the text with a pen, okay? But you can mark your Bible up. So there's marking your Bible up and then there's marking your Bible up. And I remember, I remember consciously thinking, marking my Bible up in such a way that it got recognition and then casually opening casually opening it in small group to highlight something that God had spoken to me earlier that week. And I remember her saying this, oh, John's marked his Bible up like a good man of God. Now, she was trying to encourage me. She wasn't, she had no malicious intent. She's just trying to, but oh, that felt so good. I was like, that, that, I had to get in there and try and get to the bottom of what that was. Carefully curating your appearance, your practices, so that other people see it. Third thing he says, elite access. Using faith for elite access. It says this, they love the place of honor. And the banquets are the most important seats in the synagogues. So the, in their sort of social world, they would have U-shaped tables. And yet the best seats were sort of in the middle and sort of like your social importance was revealed the further away you were from the center. And this was almost like Downton Abbey. It's like Lord Grantham, you're so right in the center. And then, you know, like sort of people move all the way down to the end where it's the people who don't even ever get to come upstairs. Very, very clear who was what. And I said, the Pharisees loved being at the center of these feasts. And, and this, there is something in us, doesn't it? We love a good green room. You don't want to see the concert. You want that backstage tour because you know someone on the crew. And I'm like, it's amazing, it's amazing all the ways this bleeds in when you live in New York. It's like, oh, have you seen, have you seen, I, I won't say it because you know, there are, not both, there are people in our church who have been very successful in Broadway. But it's like, when people say, have you seen Broadway? Like, oh yeah, my friend's in that. Yes. I got the stage tour after. Good. Want me to see if I can get something signed for you? And send it to you. There's, there's something in us that loves the association within a success. They do this in their meals and they do this in the synagogue. So they love the seats in the synagogue. The synagogues were designed kind of, kind of like this actually. I've always been freaked out by these seats to be honest with you. Like I've only started sitting in these before the reading of the teaching test. But it's like how would you feel if like during the whole sermon I was just like looking at you? <laughs> but then I realized this one, look at this guy right here. Look at this throne thing. My gosh, who built this for who? <laughs> How many of you want to get on that seat? But you can imagine if they lined up like the interns, the junior pastors, the all the way up to like this is this is the man. Something in your heart would say, What do I have to do to get in that seat? Jesus hated this, the desire for access to the elite status. And then lastly, he says this, the need for recognition, verse seven, they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Sort of a resume religion. New, New York, the city, loves a good resume, don't they? We, we have a thousand small clues of our value. 
Oh, uh, you've just moved here from college. Where'd you go to school? I went to school in Boston. Okay, good for you. Appreciate that. I wish I went to school in Boston too, but I didn't. Someone who went to school in Boston is laughing right now. We love a resume. Now listen, there's a thing about competence that is legitimate. Sometimes you're saying this stuff because it means something to a person's ability to do the job. But when you're resume padding and when you're chasing and when you love that recognition, Jesus says your motives are off. When I, when I first moved here, it was, it was so interesting to me. I moved here in 2005 to start a church and I was walking around trying to meet people. And I'd be like, how's it going? I'm here with a very, very naive and optimistic, but very sincere team. And uh, we are here to start a great church in New York City. Would you love to be a part of it? And there were some circles, basically a lot of like lonely people who were like, yes, okay. You know, they knew nothing. They just wanted love. I accept that. But then I, I would meet New York cultural elites, however you want to define them. And I remember just feeling so much condescension. Like, what's the name of your church? It's like, it's called Origins Church. And they'd be like, Origins Church? It sounds like a cult. You know, that's a makeup company. And I was like, actually, I didn't know it was a makeup. <laughs> what about how I'm acting made you think that I'd be in touch with like, I don't know, a movement of makeup products? <laughs> I remember one couple, very, very condescending to me. Met him in the early days. But then our church started to get some traction. One location, two locations, three locations, four locations, five locations, six locations. And I remember at seven locations, they joined our church. And I remember going to their house, which was significant. And at their house, they would be like, oh, you've got to meet our pastor. He's just brilliant. Just, we got seven locations. And I was just like, you wouldn't give me the time of day. I'm the same person. I'm buying Origins makeup for my wife now because of that comment you said. <laughs> I got shares in Origins. That's how beat down I was. But here's the thing. Oh, it felt so good when they acknowledged what I'd done. I, my critique wasn't on them. New York trains you to think like that. But oh, my heart felt a sense of healing at last, validation from New York elites. And I was like, I get it. I, I got to tend to my heart because that's addictive, but I know that can be toxic. We love that sense of being spoken well of, oh, there's an expert. We love that sense of recognition. Chuck DeGroat wrote a wonderful book, very challenging book if you're in Christian leadership called When Narcissism Comes to Church. And he basically defines narcissistic personality disorder as this. It is characterized by grandiosity, entitlement, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Now, I want you to think about the things Jesus has just critiqued amongst the Pharisees, and you will see grandiosity, entitlement, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Last week, we talked about Jesus says, you heap up heavy loads, and you won't even, you won't even lift a finger to help them. No empathy. Now, a lot of people have written, particularly Catholic writers, have written on the false self, our authentic self, our true self, who God wants us to be, but so often that gets wounded or we live in the flesh or there's a deep, deep self-orientation. The shadow is another word that people are talking about. And all of them say this, the worst false self is the religious false self because it gets into a system that has morality in it and certain competencies in it that you can grow in without any sort of character that will give you social validation. You can weave yourself into the structure of evangelicalism, yet in your heart, it's all for you. The false self is an insecure self. It's a performative self. He says this, it's important to keep in mind that the loyally, not read the word loyally, and perfectionist false self is a protective mechanism for his feelings of not being good enough. Perhaps he was criticized for not being a good boy. Perhaps you heard bad girl time and time again. And underneath, there's a palpable sense of anxiety. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm deficient. 
And so often you find people who have this inner sense of inadequacy, deficiency, underdeveloped identity, deep, deep wounds from either childhood or the teenage years or from churches or a family or other organizations. And that deficit aches for validation and healing. And it comes into religious environments and says, if I perform, if I perform, then I can get the room to love me and then maybe God will like me and maybe I can heal the deficit in my heart. That kind of perfectionism is exhausting and it results in a sort of a horrible spirit. Brene Brown said this, perfectionism is not self-improvement. Perfectionism at its core is about trying to earn approval and acceptance. Jesus says, this, this is not what God had in mind. That you would use my covenant, my teachings, my truth, and you would extract all of the attention and the affirmation for yourself. So what we need to do then is what Jesus teaches us in the next section, which is to convert self-seeking status for secure servanthood. Now, some of you notice that they all start with S, and I just want to say, that's what I do, man. I'm a preacher. If I can't alliterate it, I'm not going to share it. <laughs> you have to convert self-seeking status to secure servanthood. Here's what Jesus says, but you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you're all brothers and you don't need to call anyone on earth father for you have one father and he's in heaven. Nor, nor are you to be called instructors for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be a servant for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus teaches three core realities that help break our addiction to the, for the need for human validation. The one is this. He says, you've already got a true father. You have a true father. He says, do not call anyone on earth father if you have one. So a lot of people operate out of an orphan spirit. Somehow fathers seem to be able to bestow on us some kind of blessing that either sets us up to live with a source of confidence in our life or it creates a deficit where we feel like we have to strive to make up for it and earn it. And it's almost universal in every human culture. There's something built into the, the, the echo of the human family that, that mirrors the divine origin that we see in God. And so often you will see people come into the church and sort of project their father needs onto religious figures, their belonging, their authority needs onto religious figures in a hope that they may be able to do what your earthly fathers could not do. Now, I believe the church should be a place of healing. I believe in spiritual parenting. I believe in this. But that undiscerned expectation will ultimately lead to disappointment because that need that you're reaching out for can only be met by your divine father. And that's what Jesus says, you've got a father. And the good news is that that father says, you have not been given a spirit. We are a slave again to fear. We have the spirit of adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is what that means. At the de if you have the Holy Spirit in you, at the deepest cry of need in your heart, your cry will be, Abba. And the cry you will hear in response is, my child. So many people are trying to earn out of wounding what is already theirs by blessing. This is what we have. You already have a true father. Number two, you already have a true teacher. You're not to be called rabbi if you have one teacher, the Messiah. It, this is actually kind of an amazing moment for Jesus because you can imagine gathering around the Torah and be like, well, who's the right rabbi? Who's the right teacher? Jesus is like, you like the law? You like the Torah? Yeah, I did. That was mine. I did the Torah. You like the logos? I am the log. I am the logos. He's, he's basically saying all the truth you're looking for is found in me. It's found in me. Then Jesus will give the Holy Spirit, and we will get the new the new covenant. We'll get the New Testament, and as a result, the fundamentals that we need to know God and interpret His Word and walk with Him—they're already ours. I think of how addicted we are to associative greatness. We love to be connected to ministries and leaders of influence. We, lo we love this in the city. We love it inside the church. And because uh, we, we, we think that like our deficiencies can be healed by attaching to their extra giftedness. 
And I'm often amazed when I meet people and they're like, well, I, I go to such and such as church. Oh, that's great. They know Jesus. And you know Jesus too. Isn't it both great that you both know Jesus? I know Jesus too. That's the beauty of being in the family of God. We are oriented through Christ. And I, and I just say this because a lot of times people, they, they go on tour in churches thinking there's one teacher, there's one community that's going to fill this profound void in me. The void is going to be filled by going directly to the source of the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and spending time with Him. I was, that was, I mean, if, I appreciate that effort of clapping. That was like a golf clap that got some traction but faded off. (laughs) But I see that resonated because it's true. We have a, I always remember that promise when I was a new believer that says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. I was like, I don't even know what that meant, but I, I, I feel like if you get with God, He will teach you. You already have a true teacher. And lastly, it says this, you're all brothers, you have a true community. You already belong. There's no, you know, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about the inner ring and about trying to get in there and fear of being kicked out and that striving to belong. He's like, you already belong. You already belong. You're already brothers. You are covenant people. They've erected a false hierarchy and now they're making you strive to achieve, but it's a false construct because in my community, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. You're all one in Christ. You are the family of God. And so the result, if this is true, if the result of this secure servanthood is a different father, different teacher, different community, it's going to lead to a different practice of faith. This is what Jesus says. He says, the greatest among you will be the servant. The greatest will be the servant. In the kingdom of God, greatness is defined by servanthood. And, and listen, here, we know this, don't we? We know this. What is a great mother? How do you define a great mother? Is a great mother someone who's like, is, is it a, does a kid grow up and say, my mother was great? Do they mean, oh my gosh, she was like, she just like dominated the workspace and she was always gone traveling and we had two houses. Was often that kind of success can damage your relationship. Not always, but it can. When I, I hear a lot of people say, my parents were great. And I'm like, what do you mean? And here's what they mean. They sacrificed for others. Like a great greatness is stewarding what you have on behalf of others. So often the great parent is the one who comes to the games, leaves work early, prioritizes schedule for the sake of others. We think greatness is people's accomplishments out there, but often those accomplishments come at horrific relational expense. Jesus is not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, greatness is servanthood, is pouring yourself out on behalf of others. And he says, ultimately, judgment is coming on pride. And so these people who've exalted themselves, they're going to be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted in God's time. Now, this part of my talk is now over. That was like moving through the text. Okay, This is what Jesus says was wrong. This is how Jesus says his solution. Now, my guess is at this point, you've heard all this before. You may have liked my illustrations, maybe not, but you're like, no, I basically know that. Here's the question I want to ask then. Why is there so much insecurity and brokenness inside the Christian community if we know all of this? And here's my, I I spent so much time racking my brain on this. Here's my answer. Our ability to critique what is wrong is way stronger than our ability to go to the source and embody the alternative. So we get people who are like, that's just performative religion. That's just celebrity. But we don't go then, but by the grace of God, let me go live in the secret place and build the alternative. Our critiquing mechanisms are stronger than our formation mechanisms. And that's why there's so little change. So this then, I think, is the key to actually embodying what Jesus talks about. The secret of the secret place. Bob Sorge wrote a book called The Secrets of the Secret Place. Wonderful devotional. And in the introduction, I remember him, I remember reading the introduction and then I was going to say putting the book down, but it's like turning the iPad over, right? And just stepping away with reverence. Because he said this, what if there was a place I told you that anytime you had a need, it could be met. Anytime you were lonely, you could find comfort. Anytime you were discouraged, you could find hope. Anytime you wanted the presence of God, you could get it. Would you be interested? He'd be like, yeah. 
And he says, well, it's the secret place. Jesus says, your father who is in the secret place. And so his whole point is like, if that's where the father is, you need to build rhythms to the secret place. And his book is called Secrets of the Secret Place. How to live in the secret place. Now, why is this so important in terms of performative religion versus servanthood religion? Here's why. We get our sense of worth from the opinion of the person we value most. So not, not who we say, but who we value in the heart. So whoever we set up as the hierarchy of authority in our life, we will always be looking for a sense of validation from them. And if it's not God, this will create chaos in the soul. Alan de Botton, who's a British atheist, wrote a, a wonderful book called Status Anxiety. And in it, he says this, the attentions of others matter to us because we are afflicted by a congenital uncertainty as to our own value. As a result of which affliction, we tend to allow others' appraisals to play a determining role in how we see ourselves. Our sense of identity is held captive by the judgments of those we live among. And this is true. And so this is what it means. One of the greatest tasks of your life will be reorienting the person whose opinion you value the most in your life is. And that is what the secret place is about. It's about a heart reorientation back into the love of the Father. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it's a very popular verse. This is where Jesus is baptized. The heavens open, the Spirit descends. And we hear the Father speak from heaven. This is my beloved Son who I love and Him I'm well pleased. We all know this. But one of the things I, I think we don't see in this, and this is the key to what a blessed and secure identity is rooted in, is how the Father feels about us. All blessing contains these three elements. Acceptance, this is my son. Affection, who I love. And in him I'm well pleased, affirmation. Now, my guess is the majority of us are good for two or three over those. Yes, I know I'm accepted because of what Jesus has done for me. It doesn't depend on my feelings. This is a faith exchange. I've, I've repented of my sin. I'm looking to the cross through faith, and I'm trusting what Christ has done. I am accepted. Whether I feel like it or not, faith over feelings, great. And then we know that the, the Father loves us. We're singing about love. We're singing about sloppy, wet kisses. We're singing about love, love, love. But here's the thing we don't feel, that sense of affection. And you will, until you feel the affection of God, you will often default to performative religion. That's the thing that frees us. You got to know that he doesn't just love you, that he likes you. David Benner wrote a book, The Gift of Being Yourself. And in the introduction of the book, he says this. He's counseled thousands of people. And he says, what do you think the first thing God thinks about? you when you come into his presence you know what the first answer was disappointment the majority of people think that how God feels about them is disappointed how many of you think the number one thing God feels about you is delight that his spirit is like running down the road towards you like oh I'm glad you're back I'm glad you're aware of me I've been here the whole time We've got to get that, and it's in the secret place that that happens. The way we change is not by trying to will ourselves to change, and the way we change is not guilting ourselves to change. The way we change is by inner change, and then it flows out of that. Look what Paul says to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Here's the thing, if you don't think that God has chosen you, if you don't think that you're holy and you don't think that you are dearly loved at the truest part of who you are, there's no way you will be able to sustain or create an environment of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It will run out when your willpower runs out. But when you know he wants me, he's changed me, and he loves me, you are free to give yourselves away. And so the secret place is the place where our loves are reoriented. St. Augustine says this, there can only be two basic loves, the love of God unto the forgetfulness of self or the love of self under the forgetfulness and denial of God. And it's the secret place where we get so drawn up into the Father's love that we forget ourselves. We've surrendered to love. And this is what we see in Jesus. Security enables servanthood. Security enables servanthood. John 13 this is one of my favorite passages in the scriptures. 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. Therefore, he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his feet. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus' servanthood was oriented in his security and what the Father had for him. He knew the Father had put everything under his feet. He was from the Father. He was returning to the Father. Nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to worry about. Therefore, I am free the servant. As a result, God with skin on is humbling himself in the place of a servant. You will only serve in the spirit of love to the degree that you are secure in the Father's love. That means the primary task of our life is abiding in love. That's it. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in my love, you'll bear much fruit. These these are the options, abiding in love or burnout. That's it. That's Jesus. So his invitation is come and feast from me. Now, I want to just push this down one layer deeper. So, So part one, here's how the Pharisees did it. Here's Jesus' alternative. Part two, until we get to the secret place and have our deepest, truest selves healed and loved and feeling the affection of the Father will never be secure to serve. The number three then, we need to ask ourselves, in what spirit are we serving in our lives? And this is about examining our hearts. I saw this story. I was walking through the city. This is on 45th Street. And uh, I saw this picture. And I said, push your own story. This was an ad for a company. And this was, it was everywhere. It was just like slaughtered everywhere. Was, push your own story. Push your own story. Oh, that's so funny. Here's a global brand using you as a commodity to sell you your own story for their profit. But I digress. Push your own story. But this is the message, isn't it? You've got to build your platform. You've got, ma- you got to maximize your influence. Someone once as a favor said, John, I'd love to do a brand audit for you. I was like, I think I'm good. I don't, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to understand this. I just want to... <laughs> I just want to do this. A brand audit? I'm a Christian pastor. I don't need a brand audit. What I need to do is examine my heart and ask, am I pushing my story or am I pushing God's story? We have to functionally break our, affirma- our need for the, the praise of man, our own validation. Jesus critiques people again because they're afraid of the culture the Pharisees have created. Many believe in him. He says, but because they love the glory of man, the praise of man more than the glory of God, they refuse to align with him. So we have to break this desire within us. So a big part of Jesus' plan for doing this is like living the secret life. Matthew 6 verse 1, be careful. Anytime Jesus says, be careful, you should be careful. He tells us to be careless. Do not be, do do not worry. Have a carefree spirit. And then he says, be careful. Be careful. You do not practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Because if you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. And so I've developed like a little three-word test for my heart, sort of before I post stuff or before I promote stuff or before I try and talk about stuff. Here's the three words, audience, attention, and applause. Audience, who is this for? And then he asks the second question, who is this really for? Who is this really for? Who, who, Who is this? Who do I want to see this? Number two, whose attention do I need? Who, whose attention am I trying to get? See me, see, like a kid. Dad, look at me. Dad, I'm on the swing. Dad, look at me. Who am I doing that for in my mind? What is that, that council of authority, those verses I've granted in my mind that I'm trying to create that to? You should get into your heart and figure out who that is. And then lastly, whose applause do I want? How am I hoping to be honored? For whom am I looking for someone to say, that's it, man, that's good. And this, this last one's a little zing I didn't put on the screen because it's so convicting. Who's getting the attention for what I'm doing? Now, look, I'm a professional Christian, man. I do this for a living. Do you know how bizarre it is not just to speak in? Most people's number one fear in life is public speaking. 
I not only public speak, I do it for God. What sort of ego do you have to have to stand up every week and speak for God? So to ask the question, who's getting the attention? And I do, I, I always have to be like, oh, that was amazing. And I'm like, please tell me by that you meant the servanthood of Jesus. We, it, it's, we, I always remember this John Wimber phrase, I'll keep the encouragement, but I'll pass the glory. I said, thank you, I'll keep the encouragement, but I'll pass that glory. Jesus and the Pharisees have different practices, the public and the secret. They have different motives, the self versus God. And they have different rewards, public praise or the favor of God. And listen, here's here's the thing. 99% of you will go back into the city of New York for your jobs. And the city of New York is one of those places where everybody is competing for attention. Everybody is competing for applause. Everybody is competing for affirmation. What is an audition? An audition is where you work in and you say, how's it going, folks? I hope you realize that I'm better than everybody else here. Thank you. That's it. That's what it is. And when you don't get that, it's like, I want you to know that I'm better than everybody else here. And they're like, you're not. You can leave. You're like, thank you. It's painful. We live live with mechanisms. They're so confrontive. Please accept me. Please help me stand out. And, and it doesn't matter what, where you work, what it is. There is a status. There are systems. There are mechanisms where the heart aches for affirmation. And so if we are going to bring a different culture, the culture of the kingdom of heaven, we're going to have to have a different operating system, a different spirit. And it can be so hard to leave that at the door, put the armor off, and then walk in and receive God's love. Brennan Manning, in his book, Abba's Child, uh, has this very, very simple idea. He says this, most of us live with imposter syndrome versus the beloved. And he says, when you, when you show up in a room, there's two ways you bring yourself to the room. The first way is this. He says this. It's what he calls the here I am way. It's like you walk into a room and you're like, here I am. Here I am. Hey, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Well, the other one is this. There you are. There you are. And he says the imposter has to be seen. It's always stepping into the room saying, see me, see me, see me. But the beloved steps into the room and sees others. There you are. There you are. Now let's ask the question, how did Jesus' ministry happen? Jesus comes into the room and what does he say? Jesus' whole ministry is there you are. There you are. There you are, tax collector. There you are, woman caught in adultery. There you are, Samaritan woman. There you are, person covered in shame. There you are, there you are, there you are. And you know why you're here today? You're here because the God of glory saw you in your sin and your shame. And he said, there you are. What a miracle. What a miracle. So if we're going to be people who live on mission for Jesus in this city, We're going to have to have that spirit. And do you know how secure in your identity you have to be to wander through the structure of New York City with a there you are spirit in a here I am world? People say, why do you guys emphasize the prayer room so much? I'm like, because if you don't get in the presence and get your heart changed, the city will win. The city will win. And so this is, this is conscious formation. This is receiving the Spirit of Jesus. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit, not just to do things for God, but to become the kinds of people God can use who are freed from the need for human approval. Here I am. There you are. What a gift that the Spirit of Jesus, the Messiah, is the Spirit of there you are. And so I just, like, it, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's very hard to teach a word like this. And th- this, is a, this is a sermon with a lot of tears. I'm telling you, the response to this is like, oh my gosh, I have been caught up in performative religion. But here's what I want to say to you. Th- the response to this is not, okay, I'll try harder to be humble. How's trying harder to be humble gone for you? It's just like a cycle of self-validation and despair and 
Here's the, 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 the response is this. I receive your love. I receive your love. That's the response. And so if you're here today, and I would be amazed because no one shows up in New York without at least 25% of their operating system being the Pharisees' operating system. You just don't get here with some of that in you. The question is, what will you be when God's done with you here? And it could be your heart has changed. So I don't have some big response like, do more for God, repent harder, try harder. Here's my response to you. You need to receive more of the Father's love for you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. He loves you and it's not based on your performance. So can we just, can we just joyfully respond? Can we just exhale and just go, oh, the grace of God. Oh, the grace of God. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's finished. Can we receive that today? So in a way of response, would you be willing just to bow your heads and put your hands out in front of you? Not to me, obviously. I can't give you anything. But to God, where we just surrender and just say to Him, Lord, I just need more of your mercy. Maybe you're here this morning and what you need more than anything is, is an encounter with the love of God. You realize that your, your heart needs healing. Maybe you're here and you're, you've been serving in our church and you've been doing this to deal with like a childhood wound and you're like, maybe the spiritual parents will give me what my natural parent. Only God can give you that. Would you ask Him for that today? Father, heal my heart. Or maybe you're here and the deepest wrestle in your life is you don't know how to turn that, the spirit of the city off. And it's, it's wreaking havoc in your relationships and you just need fresh grace to love. So I'm just going to pray just a fresh prayer of receiving the Father's love over us this morning. And then we're going to respond more fully by moving into worship. Father, we just come into your presence. And your word says, you shall receive power. And Lord, we just turn our ability to receive from you on right now. Lord, we just say, would you forgive us for feeling like we have to do things for you rather than receive from you? Thank you, Lord, for your power. Thank you that you chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before you. Thank you for the spirit of adoption that does, doesn't cry out like an orphan for validation, but cries out to a father for union. Thank you for the cross where our sin has been put away. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who removes our guilt and our shame. Thank you for the resurrection where we can be more than conquerors over our need to perform. And it's all by your grace. So we receive your grace. Come, Holy Spirit. Wash away toxic religion that leads to exhaustion. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of grace. Come and touch our innermost being to learn from you, to know you, to enjoy you. And we lay ourselves before you. And we ask again, by your grace, for fresh mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name.